Stand up and out on flank. They all fight you. Try to split up. Oh, man, oh, man. man. Bravo two and six. What's the delay up on point? You have encompass trouble again. Get your fat ass up there, Gardner. Come on, bubble butt. Got one down in the water. Oh, this is good gear. NVA regulars for sure. You smell that? You gotta have a camp around here somewhere. Go check it out. Barnes, find an enemy weapons cache. They got all kinds of shit up in here. <laughs> yeah, they were just here, man. And that NBA scout was guarding all this. Yeah. If you interrupted him doing his laundry. Well, they're getting ready for something big. Get all this stuff. They've got RPGs, Claymore, grenades, light machine guns. They've even got mortars. We gotta call this in. Yeah, we need to get engineers up here. Lias, they can't be too far away. I want you to get your squad, move about a click down the river, and set up an ambush. Hit them on the way back. Barnes, I got short timers in my squad. I don't give a fuck. I need experienced people out there on that ambush. Now get your shit and get out there. I'll take my squad, but my short timers stay in.
What's going on guys, Prince 031 Got my good buddy Bruce at Camp Armament. Be sure to check out his channel and subscribe. Great friend of mine, he's helped me out on a lot of videos and uh, we found a very mutual interest that we both have and that is in the uh, entirety of the Vietnam conflict. So we thought it'd be a great opportunity for us to come together and highlight some of our gear. Uh, Bruce focuses mostly on the Army's gear and uniforms. I, being a Marine myself, you know, obviously I have great interest in what, you know, young devil dogs were wearing in the Vietnam era. So uh, today we're going to highlight those uniforms and gear that were worn during the uh, conflict. And uh, it's going to be a pretty in-depth video. I hope you guys enjoyed the intro. Uh, I know we had a lot of fun making it. So uh, Bruce, what you got, man? Yeah, we spent the day making the intro, believe it or not. <laughs> um, yeah, this is probably going to be, at this time, the largest gear video on YouTube. Uh, us collaborating together Mo a lot of stuff most of its Brent some of its mine but uh, wow there's a lot of stuff here and uh, we're just gonna start knocking it out going through it I'll just say this from the beginning there's a lot of caveats you'll talk to one guy in one unit in the army and another guy in the army in a different unit one year later completely different experiences completely different gear that they employed at times and techniques that they used. I'm sure that's probably true for the Marines to a point too. I think it's probably even more so in the Army. So um, we're just going to kind of run through the middle, give you a, a big overview. There will be some exceptions to probably what we're telling you. We understand that. Um, but we're just going to go with what we got because we couldn't possibly cover every exception to every rule this is just feeding you with the fire hose giving you some basic detail so that then you can take that information and if this is something you're really interested in and if you get through this video obviously you are then you can go out and start learning about the fine details and minutia of all this stuff right and i just want to point out like we're essentially focusing strictly on just straight leg infantry right now we're not jumping into the realm of uh you know, lerps and seals and all that other craziness. It's a whole nother uh, world. Right. Maybe we can cover it another time. But uh, without further ado, let's, uh, we're going to take this category at a time. We're going to start with uniforms. So I'm going to kick it over to Bruce. We're going to start with the Army's uniforms. So we're going to start out by talking about the basic combat uniforms that you saw throughout the Vietnam War of standard leg infantry. Early in the war, you would see OG 107s like this. Uh, sateens they would call them. This is obviously a marine configuration. We're going to come back and revisit this with Brent, but um, just the standard, I don't even know if it was classified as a combat uniform. This was almost like a worker's uniform, but you can see um, very simple top pocket. It was designed to be tucked in. Uh, pants have a big front pocket, but no side pocket, straight leg pants. These were um, these were kind of known as being hot, they didn't dry very well, they didn't breathe very well, and they didn't typically last very long. So we're going to go down the line when we started getting into real combat uniforms. This is kind of known, I guess, by collectors as your Type 1. This was a, a, a cotton material, a poplin material. This was really your standard where your, your combat fatigues, even those of you that wore BDUs back in the 80s, those derived directly from these. Um, you'd have a button fly, exposed buttons, but if you'll notice these pockets are really similar to what's on the BDUs. The difference is none of these really had a reinforced crotch or seat, and they didn't have reinforced knees. And throughout the war, this was the biggest complaint, I think, from soldiers all around, was that they would blow out the crotch, they would blow out the knees of all of their uniforms, and they could go through them pretty quick. Just looking at footage of guys in combat, that also happened. Usually the crotch is blown out, or the knees are blown out, or the legs are ripped. That's just how it was. But this was the first type of uniform. Same thing on the shirt, you have the kind of popular famous slant pockets which are really great exposed buttons and what they found was that these buttons would kind of get hung on things and tend to pull off uh, you even had your old style epaulets up top and you had uh, some on the sides for taking up the slack of the shirt 
There's more details to this, but we're not going to get real deep into it because it's a long video. But you can look up, uh, research the Type 1 uh, jungle fatigues and you can get more information on those. Once these were complete, they came up with the Type 2. The Type 2 was the same material, but they covered all the buttons. Uh, this is a pair of Type 2 trousers, for example. So it's cotton, a uh, poplin material, but they covered up the buttons so the buttons are no longer exposed. We still don't have a reinforced seat or knees. That won't come until after the Vietnam War. But that was the second type. The third type, which is what you all are probably most familiar with, was the ripstop. This ripstop came out. <laughs> I don't really think, I think the term ripstop is kind of a misnomer. These tear, they get really thin and they tear really easily. But if you have a really small hole, it's designed to not tear out beyond the weave. But a rip will just rip through there. But if, if you look, you'll see you've still got your, your covered buttons. They're no longer exposed. We just got a new material that was thinner, would breathe. They thought a little better and would dry a little faster. Um, it just gets paper thin, though. This is an original pair. Well, these are both originals, but this pair of pants I've had since I was a kid. And you can see... <laughs> There's a lot of repairs on these. Of course, the knees have been blown out, repaired a few times. I ain't blown out the crotch yet, but probably not that gifted. But these are just, I'm telling you, these are just thin as can be. And I guarantee you, I could pull on that really hard, and I could tear it just like that. They're just, uh, they just got thin, and they just got torn, and they had to be replaced on a regular basis. But this ripstop material was a, would carry on throughout the BDUs throughout the 80s. And even today, you can still get uniforms and ripstop material. You guys know that. So it's something that's here to stay. Um, later on, late in the war, you started seeing camouflage patterns come out. We're not talking about necessarily with special teams. We'll get into that later. But you would even see some standard infantry units start getting issued these, uh, this URTL pattern. Um, it started out with, I'm just using the term special teams for any special forces unit, whether it was advisors or LERPs or SEALs or um, Rangers, special forces. Um, there's more that I'm not even naming, but um, we're not really talking about those units, but just your standard leg infantry. Late on in the war, 71, 72, you'll have guys start to get these sometimes. They'll, they'll start to show up. So um, this was just a camouflage pattern that was developed in the 40s that ended up being printed onto a ripstop material. Really, the first ones were on a poplin, if you can find those. And they're the exact same cut. There's nothing different about these. These are a standard Type 3 cut, just like the Type 3 green fatigues. A couple of things that I'll, I'll point out on Insignia, though, because these are kind of cool. Um, if you look at these, like this one's a machine sewn Insignia. When it came to name tapes and it came to uh, unit patches, those changed throughout the years. You guys know early on you would have like the U.S. Army in gold and black and a name tape in white. That got changed out pretty quick to go to subdued. The locations of the patches changed. Uh, initially they were parallel with the ground and later on they became angled with the pockets. Uh, there was a shortage of these name tapes. When they made this change in the middle of the war, they didn't send name tapes over for everybody. So what happened was for a lot of guys to remain compliant is they went over to the local tailor in the local village and said, hey, I need some name tapes. And what they would do is they would hand sew those tapes. And this is a set of hand sewn tapes. You can see that it's just a regular poplin material. They hand sewed my name on there. The unit insignia. Also hand sewn, rough around the edges. Look at pictures, these were pretty common. So as they started phasing out the, uh, the colored patches, going to subdued, people started making their own. And it wasn't until later in the war that the patches as we know them today, the embroidered patches, really became popular and started catching up with supply. Okay, I'm going to call that good on the U.S. Army uniforms. Uh, we'll do headgear in a minute. Let's look at the Marine Corps uniforms. 
All right, so Bruce gave us a pretty in-depth uh, uniform guide, so I'm not gonna go over the same material. Uh, I'm just gonna note that obviously Devil Dogs, when they first got in country, uh, they were wearing these OG 107 utilities. Yeah, as you can see, this uh, Devil Dog shirt's tucked in. You may or may not see a Marine Corps emblem on his left breast pocket. He's using a uh, standard uh, web belt. And uh, you know we'll talk about equipment belt later. Uh, another thing I wanna point out is his boots. And uh, you know, Marines, when they first showed up, you know, they had uh, black leather combat boots. You know, they didn't have the jungle boots right away. So um, we'll talk about boots again here in a second. And uh, yeah, so moving on back here, same thing. Marines had this essentially the exact same uniforms as the uh, the Army throughout the war. Uh, started off with the OG 107s, moved on to the Type 1s, Type 2s, Type 3s. And then the biggest difference is going to be your ERDL uniforms, the camouflage utilities. I believe it was around uh, in 68 at some point, regular Marine infantry started getting issued, you know, frontline infantry guys started getting issued the ERDL uniforms. Unlike the Army, who were primarily wearing the ODs throughout the entirety of the war, um, and, and generally that uniform is regulated to, you know, special purpose troops in the Marine Corps, you know, standard grunts were wearing ERDL camo camouflage. Um, one thing you want to note though, is like the utility cover is going to be a solid OD green utility cover. And that will remain true all the way until hell, I think the, uh, you know, either late seventies or maybe early eighties, uh, before you start seeing actual camouflage uh, utility covers. But even with the ERDL uniform when it was issued, you'll see Marines with uh, OD green utility covers. Okay guys, so there were two different colors or shades of ERDL. You had a green dominant and a brown dominant. And they were just that. If you compare these two, you can see that the only difference really is that this one is tan, whereas this coloration is more of a lime green. And that makes this more of a brown dominant and this more of a green dominant. The idea was that these were designed to be used in the different areas of Vietnam that, that dictated this color shade. Uh, I don't know that it ever got issued like that. The logistics probably just got in the way. But so, one interesting point I wanted to point out is that I've got these brown dominant pants with a green dominant pocket. And that's something that's unique to 1969 dated pants for whatever reason i don't know if there was a shortage or what but collectors will tell you most of the ones that they see that are a mix of brown and green if you look that waistband is green also were made in 1969 zipper on that and so the, the, these pockets are also green dominant on the inside so maybe there was a shortage of brown dominant in 1969 not sure but every now and then you'll find a strange pair like this that i have where you've got some green dominant panels on an overall brown dominant pair of pants. So as you see, I'm wearing your standard baseball style utility cap. These are uh, issued early on in the Vietnam War. Well, I think they were issued throughout the Vietnam War, but guys were not a big fan of these. They've got a plastic reinforcement that's designed to keep them looking sharp at all times up front. Um, those get bent just like this one was. They're plastic, they don't breathe well. It's a nylon material hat that doesn't breathe well. You will see guys that probably liked them or at least were stuck with them. Even I was just looking at some 101st Airborne Combat Patrol footage today. And there were a couple of guys wearing these out in the field. Um, you see these much more on the base, guys in the rear with the gear working around the flight line or whatever, but they ended up getting everywhere. They weren't that popular though because they just weren't that comfortable. They didn't offer much sun protection and they're hot and they don't breathe well. We covered that. So pretty soon you have boonie hat come out. Everybody knows what this is. These were made with uh, originally uh, poplin material like this one, just like our top one and top two uh, jungle fatigues. And then later on they were made with ripstop material. These were all basically the same design. Some had larger brims than others. Late on in the war, they started being made in the ERDL pattern um, for, that were available for infantry issue also. Everybody knows the old M1 helmet. Uh, these were basically unchanged from Korea. They just threw a, a cover on top. They've got a special chin strap here that's designed with this like ball and socket latch so that 
If you got a lot of concussion under the helmet, it would break loose here rather than jerking your neck too hard and giving you a neck or head injury from the concussion. But these were the kind of standard old, not much different from World War II. The, the shape changed just a little bit, but you've got a composite liner with a hardened steel shell and a cover that just tucked inside there. And for the most part, for the Army, these were the uh, Mitchell pattern uh, covers. They usually wore them green side out, although there were times that they were worn brown side out, and there's no rhyme or reason as to why. It may have just been personal preference because I've seen them in the deep jungles with the brown side out. I've seen them in dry lands with the green side out. So that seemed to be just a personal preference thing. One of the big differences between the Army and the Marines is the Army was issued these little bands. You know, they'd stick everything in them. It's just a, really, it's just a heavy duty elastic band. And with the, uh, with the Marines, you didn't see that so much, but we'll cover that when we get to the Marine helmet. Lastly, I'll just point out the cravat, right? This is just a triangular bandage. It's designed that you can throw it around your shoulder, tie a knot in it, and sling your arm. But guys use these as bandanas, um, do-rags, whatever. They're the perfect size. And, um, well, it's actually a very multifunctional piece of equipment, and I can see why soldiers like these so much. All right, guys, so uh, again, the uh, M1 helmet, exact same as uh, just like what Bruce was talking about, but typically the big difference between the Marines and the Army is you're not gonna see that, that Ranger band around their uh, M1 helmets. It's either gonna be no band or you might have a, uh, you know, a piece of cut up tire that they use you know, for the, in the same manner that the Army used the Ranger band. You know, they use that to hold whatever, cigarettes or vegetation or whatnot. Um, some other configurations that you might see is this World War II or Korea era you know, mosquito net, you know, Marines might use that for uh, a helmet cover, or they would use, like, just like this uh, poncho, the old Marine helmet cover, uh, Pacific frog style skin pattern. Uh, you might see that particularly in the early years. Moving on over here, again, you got your standard utility cover, which would have been OD green. Marines also had boonies. There's OD and uh, ERDL wide brim style boonies. Okay, web gear. Typically for the Army, your most common web gear is going to be your M1956 type web gear. It is made of a cotton canvas material. Um, although you will start to see bits of nylon used as the war progresses and as technology moves on. But they were typically set up like this. A set of H style suspenders, metal hardware, a cotton webbing belt. This weave could be horizontal or it could be vertical. They used both of those. Two magazine pouches. These were originally designed for the M14 and when the M16 came out they just kept issuing these. So these are too large for a standard M16 20 round magazine. But what guys would do is they would just stick something down in the bottom of these to lift them up a little bit. It could be a block of wood, a roll of socks. I've actually got a little bandage down here that I just stuck in the bottom just to bring them up a little bit so that you can actually get them out. Otherwise this pouch just swallows them whole. Uh, each pouch would hold uh, a grenade on either side um, and this works for any of the grenades that we issued. Um, going back to the canteens, if you'll look on this one you can see that this trim is nylon. And so you started seeing bits of nylon being used um, prior to the 1967 web kit coming out, which was fully nylon. Uh, but these are still um, a canvas material with originally the early ones had a wool liner. And then the later ones like this is a synthetic material, fake wool. Canteens were just plastic green or greenish yellow canteens without uh, any type of NBC attachment on the top. And your butt pack. Now this is kind of a controversial piece of kit because you see some units that use them and some units that don't. Uh, it was designed as a small pack that you could carry some of your sustainment materials in. But a lot of times guys just found that this just wasn't big enough and they would drop it all together and just go off a rucksack. Uh, if you try to run this with a rucksack, the rucksack tends to cover it up and it just gets in the way. So you'll see a lot of guys that don't run this because they're running a pack. 
One other piece that I'll just add, kind of goes with web gear, I guess, is this bandolier. These fit the uh, M16 20 round mags perfectly. And you see a lot of guys that would just grab these, they would load these down with mags. And then what they could do is if they were in a somewhat secure area, they could drop their gear, have this on them with a the rifle, and they've at least got what they need to take the fight to the enemy for a short period of time without their sustainment gear. So it's pretty common to see if you see a guy's just wearing this and they're out in the jungle, they've dropped their gear somewhere else in a secure area that's not too far from where they are. Okay, 1967 gear. Now, 1967 gear was, was all nylon. Yes, it was introduced and adopted in 1967, but that doesn't mean by January 1 of 1967 everybody had it. Virtually nobody had it. It took a while, a good while, for this to start to be phased in. It's really not until probably the 70s that it starts to be really common. You start to see a lot of it. Although, there are some examples. You guys are putting me wrong. I don't know if this butt pack um came out with the 67 kit i'm not sure about that the 67 gear is something that kind of my weak point i don't know a lot about but i'll just tell you that you see you've got short pouches for the 20 round mags these didn't last long because what happened about the time they started making the right size pouches for 20 round mags 30 round mags came out around 1970 people started seeing 30 round mags so uh, that's the that's the army for you right but nylon belt nylon mag pouches Nylon canteen pouches, nylon uh, suspenders. Um, these were following suit of some of the nylon packs that were already out, and we'll cover those in a minute. Um, many of you guys will know more about the 1967 gear than I do. It's just not really my forte, but we've got an example here for you to look at. So here it is. All right, guys. So uh, gear for the Marine, infantrymen, and, and Vietnam. So. I think this is where a lot of people get that idea that Marines get the hand-me-downs from the Army. And we're going to talk about that here in a second. But Marines went into Vietnam in the early days with the M1961 equipment and a mixture of the older M1941 style suspenders, okay? So you're going to see a lot of stuff that's reminiscent of, you know, what this guy's father probably carried with him in Korea or World War II. Um, but I want to, if you can focus in on this utility belt, because this is going to be something that's unique to the Marine Corps. You'll notice that this has this uh, brass fasteners. That actually goes around all the way around the equipment belt. Um, you can see one on this side. And, the, and what, if you look at this pouch, it's kind of hard to see. There's actually a button inside the pouch. So these, these pouches actually button into the actual equipment belt, all right? which is you know unlike what the Army has with the uh, M56 style. So... These pouches right here are designed for your uh, M14 mags. As you can see, it holds a single M14 style magazine. And there's two different variants that I've seen. There's one that's a little bit narrower and longer and a little bit of a, like a shorter fat one. So kind of like, like a Brent pouch and a, a Bruce pouch. That was a joke. <laughs> Nobody's laughing. <laughs> Um, so anyways, uh, moving on, uh, you might actually see these, um, these, um, help me out here. Suspenders. Brain, brain fart. No, not uh, these pads, pads here. So sometimes you see them on Marines, sometimes you don't. Okay. Uh, but those are there. You know, some guys wore them. They come around the backside. So in addition, here's another big difference between the, uh, Army and the Marine Corps. So again, you're seeing a lot of, uh, World War II era style equipment with the Marine. Um, you have the jungle first aid kit. This is the same type of first aid kit that Marines would have had like on Iwo Jima. Okay, and you might have a another medical pouch there for, you know, a bandage and whatnot. Um, but again, here you got your, uh, you know, your hook fasteners and you can see, this is a good example here. And you can see that these buttons go all the way around. Okay, and then, uh, you know, your, your push dot style canteens and look at these canteens, they are, you know, the older style World War II era canteens. One trick that uh, some Marines might have done is uh, taking a grenade pin and they hook that and that just kind of helps keep these uh, M1941 suspenders together. All right, here's one thing. Here's another uh, piece of gear. This is a grenade pouch. As you can see, it hooks onto the bottom of this magazine pouch and then it ties to the uh, around this devil dog's leg. It's a three pocket grenade pouch. 
Okay, so just like the Army, you know, the Marines, in addition to that, you know, when the rollout of the M16 rifle and the adoption of it and whatnot, um, you start seeing Marines getting the M56 style gear. Also, from my understanding, I believe Marines started getting issued some gear from uh, Army storages in country. So you're definitely going to see Marines with Army M56 gear. I've got a few pieces of items on here that Bruce didn't have on his, but uh, this is a you know black 1911 a pouch for a 1911 pistol. So if you have like let's say a you know like a machine gunner or a M79 gunner that rated a pistol as like a secondary, you know you might have had a pistol such as that. Um, here's a couple bandoliers. Bruce already showed the bandoliers. That's the one for the M16. Here's a bandolier for an M14 rifle. All right, guys, so I'm going to kick off the packs here, and then we'll roll into Bruce. And uh, the reason I'm talking about that is because this is where I think, like, the Army hand-me-down stuff uh, starts to kick and play. Uh, because, again, you have Marines using gear that was reminiscent of, uh, you know, what their fathers carried in the Pacific in World War II. And then uh, you also have uh, Marines using gear, you know, well past that of what the Army has replaced. So an example of that would be, like, this uh, wooden pack board here. You know, this was probably used by the Army early on in the war, but they replaced it. But uh, you had Marines using this uh, wooden packboard well into uh, later years of the war. And the packboard was very simple. You just had shelves just like this that would, uh... there we go. You know, you could put the shelves in and then you could put, you know, something like an uh, enamel box onto that and then strap it down. Uh, you could also do that with a radio or if they had like an M20 Super Bazooka. You know, they could pack the uh, either a mortar system or super bazooka, you know, on the back or bazooka rounds or whatnot. Um, so that's just, uh, that's generally how Marines carried, you know, the heavier loads is uh, with these pack boards. As you can see, it's very, you know, dated style design, very reminiscent of uh, World War II. And this is what, <laughs> what Marines probably would have been using in World War II as well. Over here for their uh, individual pack, this is the M1941 style, you know, pack. Um, it's a two-piece system. This is pretty much for sleeping attire. I don't have it completely configured, but you, what you would see is like this, uh, these two pieces of gear connected, and then this, um, this shelter half, this Mitchell camouflage pattern shelter half rolled up and attached to the outside of the pack. On the uh, outside here is this uh, M1943 E-Tool, and Again, you can see it's got the hook fasteners as opposed to you know, something like the uh, 56 style that has the uh, Alice clips in it. Or Alice style clips, I should say. Okay, rucksacks for the Army. Your most common, your most popular rucksack throughout the war was the lightweight rucksack. Make sure I got my terminology together. This is the lightweight rucksack. And to many of you guys, you're going to go, oh, it's an Alice pack. It is actually very similar to an Alice pack. The main difference is there's no straps on it to hook it to your back. This attached to a large metal frame, an aluminum frame. That aluminum frame would be something like you would think of today like a hiker would have on, a, on an expensive hiking pack. And that aluminum frame would carry this, which was larger than the butt pack, but not as big as an Alice pack. But plus on that frame, you could carry a lot more gear and guys loaded these things down. They would put a ton of gear on there, um, carry everything that they needed to carry. This was basically their sustainment pouch and then any other gear that the unit needed them to carry would go either on top of this pack or below this pack, depending on where they put this on the frame. We just don't have a frame here to show you, but this a big aluminum frame. Bet Brent can throw in a picture of what that looked like. So this was the most common rucksack used. Um, the Arvin troops got what they was called an Arvin pack. And we're going to talk about this, not to talk about Arvin, but because this was sort of the early rucksack. Um, two big pockets, flap cover on top, nice big pocket to put everything on the inside, a lot like an Alice pack. And on the inside, you had a metal X frame with uh, adjustable shoulder straps. This was uh, really light, not just by the Arvin troops. It's a little bit smaller. It's definitely like, say, smaller than a small Alice pack for sure. But, you know, it was made for a smaller frame person. But this was enjoyed by both Marines and some Army personnel alike. You can find pictures of them using these whenever they could get their hands on them. 
And because of that and the feedback based on this pack, the Army decided that they would make their own, which they would call the Tropical Rucksack. This is a larger version of the um, Arvin pack. It had three big pockets on it with plastic snaps. It was made out of nylon, the new nylon material. It had a small area, small pouch here so you could put your map inside. This was a waterproof flap. Um, you start to have some webbing on the side so you can hang stuff off of it, your machete, your canteens. Uh, we've got a bayonet, we've got a compass, we've got a, a, a tent stake for a trip flare. Let's flip it over. What does it look like? Arvin pack. It's just a copy of the Arvin pack. It's just a little bit bigger. Same metal X-frame, just a little bit larger. Fairly thin nylon shoulder straps that are fully adjustable. Little waist pad there. Wherever the metal would be touching your back, they put these little pads to try to protect you, keep you from getting chafed. Guys love these, but these didn't come about until later on in the war, and um, so you wouldn't see these. You wouldn't see these early in the war. Again, even though that these became popular and available late in the war, it was your lightweight rucksack that was your most common rucksack throughout the war. You can see most guys, most guys, are carrying that if you see a rucksack on their back. All right guys, I'm gonna talk about boots real quick and this is pretty much universal for both the Army and the Marines. Uh, early on in the war, obviously you had both Marines and Army guys showing up with uh, you know black, all, le all leather black heavy combat boots. And uh, obviously, you know, all leather combat boots aren't the greatest, uh, most ideal boot to have you know, in a tropical jungle environment. So you know, these things would start to rot and, and break down a lot, a lot faster. Um, so what happened was, is you ended up coming up with a, a jungle boot. And there was several different variations of this, uh, but this one is probably the most common. It's got the Virum sole on it. Um, later on in the war, you started ended up with a, a Panama sole. You see the difference here? But I would say that this is probably, the Vibram sole is probably the one that's most common that would, it was used throughout the entirety of the Vietnam War. Back to the jungle boots. As Brent mentioned, there were various different types of jungle boots, but one of the biggest changes once the standard design for the jungle boot had been decided upon was spike protection. And if you'll notice right here across the tongue, it's marked spike protective. And all that means is that there's actually a piece of metal inside the sole so that guys that would step on punji stakes or nail boards it would give them an added level of protection from those going through the boot and penetrating through the boot and that spike protective has remained a mainstay of jungle boots for a long time these are the same jungle boots of course they changed the bottoms they went from this vibram style to the panama style but that panama style was used through probably Desert Storm and I had it in the invasion yeah. in 2003. All right, Iraq. so way on through. It really is a good boot. There's just nothing you can do about it. They're they're good boots. They they hold up well. They last a long time. They drain well. They're not too heavy. That this is one of the things that when they came out with this boot in the war, they really got it right in my opinion. It's been something that you can't go wrong with a good pair of jungle boots as long as they're made by a good government contractor. All right, guys. So. We're gonna talk about flak jackets. I'm just gonna go ahead and cover this for Bruce because it uh, kind of cross pollinates here. Uh, but very distinctive to the uh, Marine Corps is the uh, M1955 flak style vest. There's a few different variations of this, um, but pretty much what differs is you know pockets and this little uh, rifle butt rope that's placed on the shoulders. Um, so, but this is the M1955 style vest and. One of the big difference between this and the army vest, as you can see, it's got these uh, plates that go all the way around. And essentially this is just an, uh, a Korean War era uh, vest here that the uh, Marine Corps, and the Marine Corps used this style of vest all the way into hell, I think probably the late 70s, maybe early 80s um, before they uh, moved on. All right, so the army vest, and you will see Marines wearing these vests as well. Again, I've talked about sometimes Marines um, you know, got equipment from the Army, and that was certainly true when I was in Iraq in uh, 2003 and 2004. You know, we got some stuff from the Army, so, you know, I, I can't imagine that it didn't happen in, uh, in Vietnam as well, because you definitely see pictures of Marines wearing these types of flak vests from time to time. But this is the uh, M1952A, and uh, this is the earlier 
vest, and this is the M1969, the one that uh, replaced it. But you will see this vest being worn throughout the entirety of the war. And the big difference between these two vests is uh, you can see the collar here. So other than that, that's pretty much the, uh, the flak vest in a nutshell. So sleeping gear, that's what we're all interested in is taking a nap at the end of the day. Um, sleeping gear was typically pretty simple depending on where you were. If you were in a base camp, you might have a cot, you might even have a rack. But out in the field, a lot of times in the hot, humid weather, you wouldn't need a whole lot and you wouldn't want to carry a whole lot. So some guys would carry just a, a poncho liner. These came about early on in the Vietnam War. Initially, they were solid green. And later on, they would be in the ERDL pattern. This is an original and it's very old. It's been a used and abused but one of the ways this, that you can tell an original vietnam era poncho liner from a modern poncho liner is by looking at the center seam see how this has got a seam down the middle it was two pieces of material that were sewn together well pretty soon someone that sews these things figured out hey let's just make it out of one big piece of material and get rid of this center seam and it's a lot less work for us and so shortly after the vietnam war they started doing that other than that basically the same as the ones that you get today and these are still being issued today so if you're out in the field in a really rough area you see guys I mean uh, I, I believe this is something that went from unit to unit too they'll have this the pneumatic air mattress aka the rubber bitch blow this thing up it'll hold air for about half the night before it leaks out I don't know this one actually holds air good for me but it's just a big inflatable floaty. Now, one of the good things about this is that if you're having to forge a river, this will work. This will float your gear across. So these were kind of appreciated for that. But they're kind of heavy. They're big rubber deal even when they're out of air and you've got to carry that around. So not a whole lot of guys carried these, but at the same time, there were a lot of guys that were stuck in fire bases in little bunkers and stepped on these for a long time before they got something better. Short and sweet, guys, that's about it for sleeping gear um, out in the field. You wouldn't carry a whole lot more than this. All right, guys, I'm, we're going to talk about the uh, two prominent gas masks that were used in Vietnam. Uh, I'll start off with the early one that the Marine Corps fielded was the M9A1. And it looks like this. There's not much to it. It's just a gas mask. Um, but you also, Marine Corps also use the M17 that Bruce is going to talk about here in a second. And uh, I would say what's funny about, you know, Vietnam is that you will actually see gas mask use like in uh, Hawaii City where they used, uh, you know, gas against the VC to uh, get them out of the, uh, you know, when they were bunkered down in buildings and whatnot, um, which is something we wouldn't do today in the war on terror. Uh, was something that I guess wasn't <laughs> restricted back then. So... Uh, they definitely use that uh, capability. Okay, so here we've got the M17 gas mask. This replaced the um, M9A1 that Brent just showed you. Um, this is your kind of pork chop mask that everybody's probably familiar with in Vietnam movies. Uh, you started out with the M17 and then there was an M17A1. The difference is, and the only difference is that the M17A1 had a drink tube. And um, so that you could drink through a canteen in NBC situations. I think there was an M17A2, don't quote me on that, I might be wrong, but it actually had a device so that you could give mouth to mouth to a person while wearing your mask. It was a horrible idea. <laughs> it was a complete disaster and they dropped it pretty quick. But just so you know, that's the differences between them and how they kind of advanced through the years. Um, and, you know, Brent was talking about how you would sometimes see guys wearing these in Vietnam and carrying these. One of the probably pivotal points was the Battle of uh, Quezon when the ammunition dump was hit. There was a lot of white phosphorus and a lot of CS gas in that ammunition dump. All that stuff gassed off and settled down into the trenches where the guys were obviously taking cover and a lot of them didn't have their gas mask with them. After that... All Marines start having gas masks all over the place, including Way City. We used a lot of CS gas. Um, I even think we might have had tanks that pushed that stuff out. But at any rate, um, you start to see these more and more to ensure that we don't end up getting hit by our own CS gas uh, after the initial battle at Quezon. 
No, it's not raining. Yes, it's 100 degrees. But Brent made me put this on <laughs> so I can show you the standard GI poncho. This is basically it, okay? It's a rubberized poncho. There were two types. Uh, one is actually a cloth material. Um, we'll show you that in just a second. This one's pretty much so solid rubber. This was the later type. Um, this one's a little bit heavier, but it's more durable and it's better with water. These will snap together and they will make a makeshift pup tent or what they would call a hooch. So you could use a single one and make a small hooch. You could put two together and have a two-man hooch. You'll see that all the time. They typically didn't use shelter halves or tents or any of that rigmarole. Each guy could carry one of these and you can make a hooch in the field pretty easy. Keep you out of the rain and out of the sun. So I've got uh, two ponchos here that are already hooked together. This is already set up as a two-man two -man hooch. But if you'll look, this is a rubberized one, which we just looked at that Brett had me in with it being 100 degrees outside. <laughs> and this is the cloth one, which is actually, you can feel it. It's a thinner material. It's like a rubberized cloth. This was the earlier one. This was the later one. Uh, this one replaced the cloth one, but um, they were both issued and could be seen really at any time throughout the war. All right, guys. So right now we're going to talk about, uh, I'm going to talk about crew serve weapons and some of the uh, ordnance here. And then uh, I'll talk about the M14, and then I'm gonna turn over to Bruce, and he'll talk about the M16 series of rifles. Um, obviously, all this weaponry that you see here is organic to both the Marine Corps and the Army in that regards. So, first and foremost, the general purpose machine gun is gonna be the uh, standard medium machine gun, the M60. Um, M60 7.62 by 51 millimeter. That was used by both the Army and the Marine Corps. Some uh, SL3 gear that you're going to have for it. This is the uh, A-bag or assistant gunner's bag. You will have a spare barrel in there and some other uh, tools. Um, this is a bandolier. So inside a bandolier, you have a cardboard box here, and that will hold 100 rounds of linked 762 by 51 millimeter ammunition. Right here is the uh, M72 Law. So the Law replaced the M20 Super Bazooka. So if you'll see guys with these huge bazookas you know reminiscent of what they had in world war ii um obviously that is the uh, uh you know the bazooka that replaced those smaller bazookas a larger caliber uh, m20 and m20a1 super bazooka you know they're they're large large ordnance so you know something like an m72 law is more compact and this uh, actually expands into a longer weapon um, so right now it's collapsed if i were to expand it you have to expand it first before you fire it. So that is the M72 Law. Again, that replaced the M20 Super Bazooka. Here you have a M18A1 Claymore Mine. So that is a, a Claymore Mine. It has a, a block of C4, and in front of it is numerous ball bearings. And uh, obviously, once that's touched off and set off, it projects those uh, ball bearings forward, and that's what causes devastating effects on your enemy. So it's good for you know setting up a perimeter, going on an ambush. It'll be your initiator on an ambush. Uh, just a great piece of gear, and uh, synonymous with the Army and Marine Corps, and used throughout the entirety of the war. Over here, you have your M79 40 millimeter grenade launcher. Again, used by both the Army and the Marine Corps. This is a uh, you know essentially if you were a grenadier, you'd be armed with this, and maybe have a M1911 uh, pistol as a secondary. But you would have a bandolier just like this, that would hold six 40 millimeter grenades. Later on in the war, they actually designed a vest. As you can see right here, this is actually a, uh, a post-war sample, but it, the uh, look of it is this, almost exactly the same as the uh, wartime version. But as you can see, it's got numerous pockets here to hold numerous different 40 millimeter um, grenades, as well as you know your different pyros and whatnot at the top. All right, moving on, individual weapons. So. Both the Army and the Marine Corps started the war with the M14 service rifle. So this is a uh, civilian variant of the M14. This is the M1A. The only real uh, cosmetic difference here is that it doesn't have the uh, full auto switch right here, which would be located right here in the back side on the right hand side of the uh, weapon. Um, other than that, cosmetically, this looks exactly like what an M14 would look like. And the Marine Corps started the war with the M14, chambered in 7.62 by 51, and later transitioned into the M16 that my buddy Bruce here is gonna go over. 
The M16 rifle. We're going to do a brief overview because I will have some detailed overviews eventually on my channel and you can Google search those to your heart's end. There's plenty of them out there. Um, the military started out with the M16 and um, found some deficiencies with it and started working on those deficiencies. There were some M16s issued in Vietnam early on. Pretty soon they came out with a, an experimental version known as the XM16E1. That's what this is. It had some improvements um, that they found were lacking on the M16. The biggest one everybody talks about is the forward assist. Okay, it's on here now. This is an XM16E1. The main difference, um, way to tell these apart by looking at photos is by this partial mag fence. You see how this doesn't come all the way around the mag release button? This is called a partial mag fence. It's only got a fence here, not all the way around the mag button. This is an XM16E1. That would designate it as an XM16E1. Uh, it has full auto capabilities. It's got forward assist. It's got a chrome line chamber. It's got um, 20 inch, one and 12 twist barrel. No trap door in the butt plate. This was just a transition from the M16 to the M16A1. This was a very common rifle though. A lot of these were used, a lot of these were fielded, and you started seeing them in different configurations. Uh, and by configurations, I mean that you start to see them transition from some early war parts being used to some later war parts being used because these were in use for so long. This was replaced by the M16A1. Everybody knows this rifle. Uh, this rifle had a chrome line chamber, a chrome line bore. It had, um, of course, the forward assist. It had a full fence lower, like so. It goes all the way around the mag release button so that that can't be ac accidentally depressed while it's laying flat on the floor against the log. Um, this one does not have a trapdoor butt plate. Some didn't, some did. Later on, they started to get this, but some of the early ones did not have it. Uh, they also really didn't have a chrome lined carrier. Uh, those were phased out in the XM16E1, and by the time the M16A1 came out, these were just parkerized or phosphated, just like they are today in the AR platform. Compensator? Compensator, yeah. You started out with the three prong flash hider on the M16, it was found to be weak, so they beefed it up on the XM16E1, and this thing got hung up on everything and they still had some problems with it, so they completely enclosed it in on the M16A1. That doesn't mean you won't see an XM16E1 with a birdcage, and that doesn't mean you won't see an M16A1 with a three prong, because people did funny stuff in the armories, but typically speaking, this is how that they were issued. Well, look at the little shorties. Um, these followed the same lineage as the XM16E1 and the M16A1. It's going to be a little bit confusing here because we're talking about a bunch of numbers, but basically when the XM16E1 was being developed, they started developing a submachine gun replacement. I know it's not a submachine gun, but Colt marketed it as that because it was there to replace existing submachine guns like the Thompson, the M3 grease gun, and all the foreign stuff that pilots were trying to put in their airplanes and fly around with. So they came up with this little guy. Um, the first one was the XM177E1. The XM177E1 had the same partial mag fence as the XM16E1. Um, it also had a shorter barrel with a, comp with a uh, moderator that was moved all the way down. Uh, it was a 10 inch barrel with the moderator stuck on the end, so it was a little bit shorter than this. At the same time, the experimental grenade launcher was being put together, and a lot was being filtered by a lot of those uh, spec ops guys, and they said, hey, we want to be able to put that on our new little carbine, right? So they just extended the barrel out, put a grenade mount here, so now the experimental grenade launcher would actually fit under this little thing. They kept the same moderator on the end, they just extended the barrel out a little bit, it ended up with an M16A1 lower and was redesignated the XM177E2. And that's basically what this is a copy of.
as close as we as civilians can get to one. Metal stock. Um, they all, all the Vietnam guns would have had a metal stock, and all the Vietnam guns would have had um, a, mod, a moderator. Um, these were the only two variants that were really that were really fielded: the XM 177E1 and the E2. All right, guys. Well, that concludes this video over the uniforms, weapons, and gear for the United States Marine Corps and the United States Army during the Vietnam War. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the video. I know we had a lot of fun making it. We put a lot of effort into making this video. Uh, we've been out here for several hours, and it is in the middle of summer in North Texas, so we're sweating our balls off. So true Vietnam climate. <laughs> Very realistic. <laughs> yeah. So what do you got, man? Uh, what to say. We have a ton of gear to put up, and we've got a ditch back there full of Viet Cong gear. <laughs> you guys don't even know. And the sun's sinking fast, sinking low, so we wanted to wrap this uh, video up. I'm sure there's some stuff that we forgot to cover, and I'm sure there may be a couple of things we misspoke on. Just please forgive us. We ran through this thing doing the very best that the two of us could do. Um, I was hindered quite a bit because I had a Marine helping me, but um, <laughs> we got through it. I hope you enjoyed the video. We love putting it together, and I think that for anyone that's interested in Vietnam infantry gear, this video should at least get you started down the right path. Yeah, and uh, one thing I want to throw out there is we love hearing from the actual veterans, and there's still plenty of Vietnam veterans out there uh, definitely going to be watching this video, so please, we love reading your comments. So. If, you're, if you're a Vietnam vet, and if you don't mind commenting, just, you don't even have to comment about the video. Just tell us what unit you were in and, um, and, and what you did there. Just a, a sentence or two. It means a lot. We read those things, and, um, right. you know, we're big supporters of our veterans, and particularly our Vietnam veterans who... We kind of got the short end of the stick when they got back home. Absolutely. So they definitely didn't get the reception I did when I came back from both Iraq and Afghanistan. So uh, my heart's out to them. And, Absolutely. Uh, you know, welcome home, brothers. That's right. So, Semper Fi, guys. And uh, thanks for watching. And don't forget to leave a comment.